Overcoming Adversity podcast. I'm your host, Michael Allison. So many of you have heard about the five love languages, but today you're going to hear about it from a different aspect. And you're also going to learn about how making small deposits into your life could deliver significant returns. Today's guest is Mr. Paul Zolman, and he's here to tell us about his story. I can't wait to get into this episode. Paul, oh, welcome to the Welcome to Adversity podcast, man. It's a pleasure to have you here as a guest, man. Thank you, Michael. My pleasure to be here with you. Absolutely. So I really want to dive into this topic because your story is one that is quite fascinating and has been through quite a few traumas in your life, some things that I know is going to hit home for some of our audiences that when it comes to some abuse or some substances that may have gotten involved in people's lives. And you have, you are one that has overcame that. And for you to be here to tell us about your story, man, I just want to applaud you for doing that. And yes, man, thank you, man. Thank you for just coming on and just uh, doing that. So if you can, man, tell us a little bit about what is it your role is now as a love language linguist, because I found that to be fascinating. And how did you even get to that particular point? It's very interesting, Michael, and it's a great question. I, I think that I want to back up just a little bit, tell a little bit how how I was not where I'm at today. Right. And, and at the in in any sports that you play, there if you play if you or are practicing resistance training, you're training your muscles to do something so that you'll be stronger. And I think that that's what I started my life with. It was resistance training, and I was resisting my parents. As most teenagers will, and most young people will, they're going to resist their parents. But I'm going to go back to my grandfather just for a minute, Michael. My grandfather was born in Ohio, um, or in Indiana, excuse me. And mm-hmm. in Indiana, he grew up, he married, had nine children. Wow. When, when that ninth child was, shortly after that ninth child was born, his wife passed away. And as any person would be, they'd be distraught and and. We, we learn now that in this day and age, that when you're distraught like that, don't make any major life decisions. He didn't know that in that day. He sold the farm, he sold all the equipment, and then he gave, he, he systematically would say to the people that came to pick up the equipment, would, and would you like this child? And oh, would wow. you like this child? And would you like this child? Until he had given all the children away, except for one. That one child, he, Benjamin, he took with him to Montana, found a school teacher that had never been married, had 10 more children. 10 more. 19 children, Michael. <laughs> 19. Yeah, I can't even imagine that today. I can't even imagine that. And to strategically do that, I really want to know more about why he did that, because that's even more fascinating now. Well, it's, it's a fascinating story all by itself. But my father's number six of that second 10 children. And so he's number 15 of all 19. Wow. What, he's born in 1922. And when he's 10 years old, unfortunately, this grandfather passes away. Mm-hmm. So now, Michael, you've got 19 abandoned children. And you're in the middle. 1932 would be my father would be 10 years old. You're in the middle of a Great Depression, the Great Depression. Mm-hmm all the economic issues, now all, all the, the shortage of money and work and all those things are impacting this family. My my grandmother, the sweetest sweetest person of all, a school teacher, I remember visiting her, I'm number 10 of 11 children. So my father toned it down, Michael, only had 11 children, not, not 19. So with the generations are getting better and I only have eight, Michael. So we're... <laughs> <laughs> It's getting better all the time. So, <laughs> so this grandmother was just the sweetest lady. I remember walking up the little steps to her apartment, and she was just so loving. I just remember just great fond memories. I don't know how she made it through all that, all that she had to endure during those times. My father had it so difficult, and the economics were so difficult. He 
went to school a few more years and graduated from eighth grade, didn't get any more education than that. And he became a truck driver and he was gone during the week. On Fridays, he came home and he dated my mother every single Friday, Michael. This is what I absolutely love about my father. I don't, I can't even keep up with that pace of dating every, every single Friday. I wish I could, but I, I'm, I've never been able to do it. And I just wonder, I don't rem ever remember him missing. So I know that he really valued women. And unfortunately, that went against me because I'm a thorn between two roses, uh -huh. an older sister and a younger sister. All the rest in the family are boys. So mm -hmm. I can imagine my mother on that date, it was always at the Maverick Bar. My father wasn't very creative about the date. Always the Maverick Bar, always over alcohol. And while he's getting imbibed, he's getting annoyed at my older brothers because my mother would start at the top, I'm sure, and then go down. When you get to number 10, you're annoyed 10 times, and that's all, <laughs> that's all stacking up. And I'm getting the brunt of that, Michael. So it's just horrible. I did not look forward to the weekends. Wow. It was either a belt or it was a, a severe spanking. And I remember one severe spanking that I remember being black and blue for more than three weeks. Mm. The problem with all that is that there were a couple of problems. I didn't, I didn't remember what I did. I was just getting punished, but I didn't remember what I did wrong. And it, the, just the lag between the, the event and the punishment was so bad that you know the, my parents just couldn't resolve that and try to make it closer to the event so you knew what you did and you, right, knew, right. you knew why why you were being punished. I didn't have any idea. I still don't have any idea. <laughs> but to get out of that situation, Michael, what I had to do is basically move out. So at 17 years old, I move out of the house. It's right after my junior year of high school. I'm moving out and I'm I'm moving in with my brother. My brother's married. He has a couple of children. But I noticed that he has the same issue, that he'll get annoyed, get annoyed, get annoyed, get annoyed, and flash. Just have mm -hmm. that anger, anger flash. And as, as I grow a little bit older, I get married, have children myself, I notice I've got the same generational problem. Patterns, wow. Just, just that stacking effect. And I realized that, that I'm being annoyed at what somebody else is doing. It's as if I'm, I'm wanting to make their decision for them. All right. That's totally out of my lane. It's it's not something that I should be doing. And then I'm casting judgment that way. Why should I even be annoyed at that? Because I can't make any choices. I can't change it. There's nothing I can do about that. So I realized that I need to stay in my lane and, mm -hmm. and do what I do what I need to do. And I, I decided that I wanted to be uh, that I did not want to be angry. Mm -hmm. so at age 35. I'm still blaming my father for all this social awkwardness because when you stack, you stack, you stack, you stack all these annoyances and have that flash in public, it's kind of embarrassing. Right, very, right. Very, very awkward. Who who wants to be around? And my family would scatter and say, I don't know that guy. Who is that guy? And it was just just that horrible scene, you know. And and it happened in family. It happened in public. It just was something I wanted to stop. So I said, I don't want to be angry. And that's like a double negative, Michael. It doesn't work except in math. You can multiply a negative number by a negative number. Then you get something positive. Right. It, doesn't, it doesn't work in relationships. No. It just absolutely doesn't work. So that anger and that, that, um, that tendency to flash probably was contributory to the demise of my first marriage. After 23 and a half years, there, there were other things, but after 23 and a half years, I became the custodian for the uh, primary custodian for the five children that were remaining in the house. On the weekends that my wife had the children, what I decided to do, Michael, was to go destination dating. Midlife crisis, let's go have some fun. So I choose someone online. They're in a different city. I'm in a different city. We'd pick a city to meet and we'd have a date. It was fun. It was great times. I would hold, on, hold on, hold on a second. I've never heard of this before. Never heard of destination, Destina destination dating. I've never heard of that before. Well, Tell me a little bit about that because that's new to me. Well, so much fun, Michael. You got to try it. But there's, no. there's absolutely no, no results. <laughs> there's no results, though. I mean, I'm gonna just there's not a good story at the end of the story. It was just fun. So I went to Daytona Beach. I went to Jacksonville, Florida. Went to Atlanta. 
Columbia, South Carolina, Charlotte, North Carolina, New York City, Kansas City, Nashville, Salt Lake City, Phoenix, Las Vegas, Snowflake, Arizona, Cabo San Lucas, all these places, I'm going for a destination day. Just having a great time, not finding anything. Mm-hmm. It's, like, it's like the lyrics of that song, Michael. You're looking for love in all the wrong, the wrong places. Exactly. Yeah, not, not finding it. I thought I had a line on somebody, and I moved to Phoenix, and in, in Phoenix, it just didn't work out. So here I am. I'm single in Phoenix. My ex-wife had decided that after three and a half years of me being prim- primary custodian that she wants to take the children back. She's on her way moving to her parents' house. And, and I thought, this is a perfect opportunity for those remaining three children to get to know their grandparents. I just wanted that to happen. And it was good for the children to do that. So I'm all alone. In Phoenix, my sister calls me, my older sister, and he, at number 10 of 11, you don't have very many choices. I was the remote control in the day, Michael. My older brothers and sisters, they tell me, you go change the channel on TV. I, my legs were shorter, so they were closer to the ground. I had to get up and go over and do that. And it's when you had to turn the knob to turn the, the knobs. <laughs> yeah, all the knobs to the channel. I'm the remote control. So you got to do what your older brothers and sisters tell you to do. And she's saying, I've got this neighbor I want to introduce to you. I said, oh, no, I've done destination dating. I didn't find anything. Spent over $10,000 in a year and a half traveling all around. Didn't find a thing. I don't want to do it. She's seven hours away. Mm -mm." She says, oh, come on. You got to do what you got to do. So I said, I tried to placate her. I said, well, I'll email her. Mm -hmm. What kind of relationship can you develop with email? Tell me. I I need to know. No, not much. Not much. <laughs> yeah, good. Well, I didn't meet someone face to face is, is going to be a struggle. It's better, yeah. Well, I didn't think it was going to be much, but she turned out to be a really good writer. And so, you know, after four or five exchanges, I get a little bit brave. I said, "Well, how many times have you been married?" And she writes back and says, "Counting the five that are buried in the backyard." <laughs> and I'm, I'm, just like, I'm, I'm howling, laughing because. No, I got a live wire here. I got somebody's got some personality. They got <laughs> some humor going here. And, and I'm so I'm I'm a lot more interested now. So these words were starting to help me. And you know, before words, I realized that physical touch was my love language mm-hmm. before words. Now the words are starting to come up. Yeah, you know, I'm getting away from that physical touch. The words are really more my primary love language. So I'm really interested here. So we start correspond a little bit more, I start visiting, and then I decide to move up by my sister. We start getting serious, and now it's time for big brother approval. Got to have that. Remember, I'm 10 of 11. So go to big brother's house, 300 miles north, and first thing we go in the house, my sister-in-law pulls her aside and said, the only emotion pulls the, the my, na- my sister's neighbor side, the lady that I'm with, Poser Sign said the only emotion that the Zolman family learned growing up is anger. Mm. At first I denied it, said, uh uh-uh. uh. Then it made me mad. <laughs> I'm busted. Told, totally busted, Michael. So I realized at that point that that's a turning point. If there, if that's the perception of the Zolman family, I have an opportunity right then and there to change that perception. So I started reading the color code and reading the five love languages by Dr. Chapman. And really the five love languages resonated with me. Dr. Chapman's a a pastor and he said that the five love languages reconciled to the life of Jesus Christ. I'm a Christian. I wanted to be more like Jesus, more like, have just be more like him, more loving in that way. I was a long ways away. I'm still- At at what stage in your life was this this came into like fruition for you because it sounds like you were going, you, you were married and then you went through a divorce and you were going through a transition. So at what stage in your life was this particular moment starting to take place for you? So I'm, I'm single. I'm, I'm still, I'm seriously dating this lady until, you know, things, things got uh, upset uh, apple cart at my brother's house a little bit. So, mm-hmm. I mean, just, I'm, I'm still single. And so I'm, I'm realizing that I, I need to change this. So I started doing all that at, after that moment, after that introduction of that woman to my brother. I said, pause for a second. I really need to get my own house in order. 
Mm. And it's just, it was really more uh, if if people have that perception of me and I still had those problems and uh, it, it just, I didn't want that to happen. I didn't want to continue to pass that on. So I had to, it's like the last supper, Michael. I don't know if you're a Christian or not, but at the I'm... last at, at the last supper, Jesus asks, says, says to all the disciples, says, one of you is going to betray me. And one by one, each one of them said, Lord, is it I? And I started asking myself that question about relationships. Lord, is it I? Am I the problem in this relationship? And you, you don't want to know what the answer was. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a hard question to ask. If you don't want to know the answer, just don't ask the question. Don't ask the question. Yeah, don't ask that question. So, so I realized that I'm in, in the large part that problem. And so I need to develop that that more loving skills. And I want to just illustrate it. The other day I was out walking and I and I found a walking stick. You know, everybody everybody goes walking. Sometimes I'll look around for a walking stick. But I found this walking stick and one side of it's really nice and smooth. It's just perfect. Not, no knots going to get on your hand. But the other side has some little, little prickly parts or really points that could kind of poke you. And, and I'm going to call this the naughty side of the stick. And mm -hmm. this, is, this is the nice side of the stick. Naughty and nice, just like Santa Claus. Everybody has a naughty and nice stick, Michael. Everybody, that's how you get your presents. I knew you knew that, but <laughs> just just checking. So I, I've got this naughty and nice stick, and I'm realizing that anger is on that naughty side of the stick. That all the the humor, all the put downs, all the sarcasm, all the uh, just just the just all the everything, the words, just all every it's like a culture just it's all on that naughty side of the stick i realized well if my sister-in-law says i'm still on that naughty side of the stick i gotta run i gotta get out of here or i have a couple other choices i become more angry or i just remain the same and what remain the same looks like is that you blame other people like i was blaming my dad if you blame someone it's their fault i don't have to change i don't have to do a darn thing I can just stay like I'm at. That wasn't really a choice. I mean, I needed to become better. So I needed to learn languages of love as there is a language of anger. I needed to learn the vocabulary. I needed to learn the humor. I needed to learn the softness of love. So let me ask this question. So I know it, it took it took maybe that situation to... Um, to experience that or someone to maybe ask you those questions for you to go through that. But as I'm listening to your story and of one that was married for 23 years, when you guys went through that divorce and you was going through that process, did you think that I want to like stay in this relationship or keep the family together and try to like dig into that at that moment? Or did you say that, I'm just going to let this relationship go and just see what happens afterwards. Cause, cause I'm asking that because you kind of made a decision to do the um, like destination dating and all that in between there. So I just trying to understand what was, what was your mindset at that particular moment when you was going through that divorce? When you're going through a divorce, you, you always have those, those ideas of, well, what if, what if I made these little, little changes? What if, and, and would it work then? And it, in the situation I was in, you know, my uh, wife was, at the time was going to a college class. She had, she had put off going to college and finishing college because of having children, that sort of thing. She was a stay-at-home mother, and now she was going to college and beautiful. Uh, she was in her early 40s, but she was telling kids at college that she was 28. And so she was just, just playing with them and, and just having a great old time. And she chose, she decided she wanted that lifestyle. And so the, the options of, of getting back together weren't really, in, it wasn't really in the cards that she was, she really wanted that particular lifestyle. Uh -huh. So, so and, and for her to have that lifestyle, I needed to have the kids. So I'm a single, single dad with the five kids. And that's, that's kind of how, how that came together. Uh -huh. Yeah. Let's see. So it really wasn't an opportunity, opportunity that way for her because she'd already made the decision she wanted that particular lifestyle. I'm sure the anger that I had at the time was, was like I said, contributory, that maybe she didn't want 
uh, the lifestyle, the continued lifestyle that I was projecting with with the children, everything going on at the family as well. So what steps or procedures or what type of help did you recognize that I need to get some help in some of these areas to become a better person? Well, before the divorce, we actually had some marriage counseling and, and from time to time, there's been some some steps along the way. We had some marriage counseling. There was one uh, particular time uh, before before she started going to college that I'd gone through some anger management classes. I voluntarily actually went to the anger management classes while the other guys in the class were actually court ordered to be there. I, I was voluntarily there and, and those people that were court ordered there, one guy had held his uh, wife up by the neck to, with his hand like that with her feet off the floor wow. until, until she passed out. Another guy had beat his girlfriend so badly that she was in the hospital they were that's why they were in anger management i was there just to learn learn how i could be a better person so what i took from that michael and i thank you for the question that's really good question what i took from that is that i ne really need to learn opposites if if i was abusive in that way if if there if it was economic abuse or if it was emotional abuse what would be the opposite of that or mm -hmm. if it, you know and I, and as i'm trying to figure out opposites i'm trying to understand the spectrum just like that the, the naughty and nice stick I, what, what is the naughty behavior and what's the nice behavior what would be the exact opposite of that nice behavior take for example sarcasm sarcasm i i would place it on the naughty side of the stick because it's naughty but sometimes it's just very funny absolutely mm -hmm. hilarious uh, to to use sarcasm we use it a lot in this society but it's naughty because the opposite is being genuine being mm -hmm. being true okay. Be right. uh, you know, just just being authentic. That's and that, and those are characteristics that you'd want to have. That you should be searching after those type of characteristics in your life. I and see. The, the sarcasm doesn't really fit within that character. I see. So let me ask you this question. So when you speak of love languages, you know, when I was younger, my love language was a certain way. Once I got into a relationship with my wife. I started realizing a lot more around my love language and how which one was in regards to the five love languages some of them would be number one to number five and sometimes they'll change throughout our relationship as we as we've grown we've been together now over 10 years yeah so when it came to you right recognizing understanding what was your love language is once you like came into understanding what it totally is how did you actually find out what is your primary love language? And for you, did any of that change or shift it once you started understanding the concept behind of love, what a love language is? Great questions. A lot of questions there. Let me just uh, preface it by when, after I read the book, The Five Love Languages, I read it four or five times. I went through the book. The book didn't go through me. In, in mm -hmm. other words, I didn't understand a lot of it. If you would have asked me, just remember where I came from, Michael. If you would have asked me what the five love languages were after I read the book four or five times, I might get three. I, right. if, if you offered me a million bucks, I'd really try, but I think I'd only get three. And it still, it still wouldn't matter. It just it wasn't inside of me. And so, so you know, Dr. Chapman, bless his heart, I love that he discovered this the theory of the five love languages and how we can apply it. And how it really kind of shows up in our life that everybody's got a primary love language. But Michael, I'm, you know, he, Dr. Chapman said, if I, if I guess, Michael, what your love language is, and if I cater to that, we're going to be buddies. But I'm a really bad guesser. And, and I, it's, it wasn't happening for me. Just most of the time, it was not happening. The second thing Dr. Chapman has, well, he's this little survey in the book. If you take that survey, then you do you could discover what your primary love language is. Right. Well, what do you do with that, Michael? Advertise? Hello, Michael. I'm Gifts. What do you have for me today? <laughs> Back to awkwardness. We're done with awkward. I've done that before. It just doesn't work. Right. I didn't want that awkwardness. So I I remembered a time at, in my childhood, Michael, that that as dysfunctional as our family was, we got together once in a while and played games. I remember those like, great times. I thought, well, what if I could make this a game? And I, I thought, well, I'm going to contact Dr. Chapman. 
and I wrote him an email. I said, Dr. Chapman, are you licensing those little icons for each one of the love languages? And his attorney wrote back and said, no, we're not. So I contacted an attorney locally here where I'm at and, and a copyright attorney, intellectual property attorney. And he said this, he said, theory, like the love language theory, is not copyrightable. Application is. Ah. Well, they weren't doing it as a game. So I thought, well, I can make my own icons then. I don't want to use theirs. They're dated anyway. So I made my own icons and put them, put them on a die. And so that's what I have right here. So just mm -hmm. a little, little cube. There I have a hand holding, holding a gift. That's for gifts. Two hands touching. That's for touch. Got a hand holding a, an hourglass. That's for time. A hand holding a platter. That's for service. And then two hands put together for, to make a, form a heart with a conversation fly out of the heart, like a cartoon, like the mm. heart talking. Those would be the words. Five love languages, six sides on the die. I created this side as a surprise me. So, Michael, there's just two instructions. You roll the die every day. That's the love language you practice every day. So back to answering your question, as I'm rolling a die over a 30-day period, that's when I learn all five love languages backwards and forwards. I know what it is like to send it out, and I'm watching for it to come my way. It suddenly gave me a peripheral vision. I could see, well, they're loving on me. It's not my primary love language, but they're loving on me. I can still respond, and I can read that a whole lot better than just watching for my own love language and sending it back. And it, it became like, you know, Dr. Chapman's, unfortunately, and I'm sure it's inadvertently, his his suggestion is just became like a little pity party and, and, and that if he discovered what your love language is, he said you should tell your significant other. And then what happens is that, well, I told you how to love me. How come you're not doing it? And you get this little whiny voice pity party and I didn't want any part of that. So I said, this is what I'm sending out. And this is what I'm sending out all day. What I'm watching for is when people light up. No longer, Michael, do you have to pause the relationship, say, excuse me, could you hold the relationship just one moment while, mm -hmm. while you take this survey and so I can discover how to love you? <sighs> That's awkward again. We don't do awkward now. So we're it's making it easy. You use your observation skills. You're watching when they light up. Now they'll light up on their first primary or their secondary love language. You make a mental note and then you just wash, rinse, repeat. Do that over and over for that person. You're watching for that all day long. You're trying to help people have a better day. That's how I learned the five love languages. That's how I became what I call a love language linguist. Michael, you can have that title too. All you have to do is practice giving away. I know it's a sexy title. I know you need it. I know you want it. <laughs> you can have it. So, thank you, man. I appreciate it. So, you know, me and my wife was at a uh, a marriage. Um, we're we're doing a marriage session with at our church. It's called the Naked Marriage. And one of the key takeaways from yesterday's lesson that we took was learning how to serve each other. And we we got back in the car and we started talking to each other kind of around what our love languages are and how we serve each other through that thought process. I want to ask you, man, um, gaining this knowledge, this wisdom that you've developed and you actually worked on it. Like I could, I could tell that you worked on it in regards to like investing in yourself mm -hmm. to seeing big rewards. Now, can you talk a little bit about when it comes to like self-reflection and looking back at like where you're at now and the knowledge and the wisdom that you've gained to the practice that you've created to your past. How, how do you look at things now in regards to like self-reflection? That's a great question, Michael. And I think that um, practicing the love languages and becoming that person really is a character thing. And it's, it's you're building a character. And as you're building a character, you're stacking. Just as I was stacking those annoyances on top of one another, now it's stacking the kindness, one kindness on top of another, on top of another. And as you build that kindness, it's something that you, you can you could go downstairs and, and not do, say, I don't want to talk to anybody. You could just you know, bow out for a day. 
but it's not going to help you. It's not going to help anybody else. So you can just stack, keep stacking those kindnesses and you'll get to a point that you'll get to the higher laws of love, what I call the higher laws of love. You'll get to the compassion. You'll get to the intimacy. You'll get to the mercy. You'll get to the, the empathy, the sympathy, and you'll get to that uh, charity. You'll, you'll get to forgiveness. You'll get to all these higher laws of love by practicing these basics. As I've worked through these, Michael, I found that these are basic. These are very foundational, something that we should build our build our foundations on. So the answer to your question about do I look back? Yeah, I look back, but I look back and it's like, I don't want to be that person anymore. This is the person I want to be. I, one thing about Dr. Chapman that I found curious is that you know he did the book originally for couples and to to and kind of enhance the relationship between couples. When, when I developed this, Michael, I was single. I didn't have that significant other to love. So I decided, made this decision that, well, I'll just love everybody. Thankfully, I did not have anybody at that time. And I made it so it loved everybody becomes because it becomes a character trait. That loving just your significant other is a part-time job. Who do you ever know that is with their significant other 24-7 or wants to be? <laughs> so you also put out a book man and it talks about what you're here talking about now can you tell our audience a little bit about your book and sure. where can they find it the role of love the most effective way to demonstrate love every single day man tell us a little bit about your book yeah so the book is a lot of this backstory that we've been talking about but it also identifies the the love languages and each one of the love languages goes through that but I also identified the the role of observation because this observation that you're doing watching for people to light up is critical for you to learn the love languages R critical for you to remember that R critical for you to remember and develop these relationships because you'll remember that that person oh they like the words they like compliments they like that sort of thing that lights them up Mm -hmm. And you'll be able to do that over and over. And you're building these deeper relationships with these people, stacking these kindnesses one on top of another so that you'll get to that that higher level of love. That's what the book's all about. I do have a journal as well. So what, what this is for is you, in, in the classroom, you have the teacher roll the die at the beginning of the day. Then at the end of the day, what happens is that the class will re record what they rolled, what opportunities they saw to love in that way, what they did about those opportunities. So instead of having to wait like I did till 35 years old to realize, oh, I'm responsible for my own actions. Now you're teaching these young children that, oh, I'm responsible for my own actions. Secondly, it becomes a journal for that child. The teacher at the end of the day will check off that they did it. They take that page home the astute parents will hold on to that page and collect all those pages in sequential order at the end of the year. Now you've got a, a love journal for that first grader or that third grader or that fifth grader. Who wouldn't have loved to have a love journal of, of those early primary years when you're in, in school? What was it that, that uh, was so special about that te first grade teacher that you remember? I remember Mrs. Rogers' name. I don't remember my second grade teacher. I don't remember my third grade teacher. I don't remember fourth grade or fifth grade. I do remember sixth grade, but there's something special about those teachers. What was it that I loved about those teachers? And now you're tamping down a lot of violence. You're tamping down a lot of misbehaving because now these children, not the teacher, not the principal, are responsible for managing their, their behavior. It's those children's responsibility now to manage their own behavior and to write about it at the end of the day. I've talked with teachers around the world, Michael. They said the last 10 to 15 minutes a day is really non-productive time. Mm. The, kids, the kids are antsy. They've been there all day long. Their minds are mush. This is a decompression type of activity. Just de decompress before you go home, decompress, write what you loved about that day. Well, thank you for that, man. I, I love uh, some of the practical applications. One, somebody that's listening to the show, some of the things they could um, implement into their lives at this very moment. I want to follow up, man. So 
when I was younger and for one that was going through quite a bit of trauma, you know, I had a, a bit of like unforgiveness to deal with and a lot of resentment around people or things that occurred to me in my life. And it was not until I chose to start working on myself and start loving myself first where I could even pour into other people. If you can talk a little bit about how important it is when it comes to the love languages of working on yourself, because I saw, I know that's what you did in regards to loving on yourself first before you can start pouring in, into other people. Absolutely. Michael, thank you for that question. I really want to paint the picture correctly for, for me, this is how it worked. I found that, that as down as I was, I could go out in my neighborhood. I could go down the street. I could go to a rest home, assisted living home. I could find people that were in a whole lot better shape or a whole lot worse shape than I was. When I found those people and sat down with them, spent some time with them and talked with them about their problems, all of a sudden my problems are a whole lot lighter. And it was just actually, actually getting out, giving kindness or giving time or giving a love language, so to speak, a way that I found myself. And it's just almost counterintuitive, Michael, that you you're, you don't think you have much to give, but you can always find someone that's lower. Always find someone that, that you can maybe pull them up, give them a hand, pull them up a little higher and help them have a better day. When you do that, you're paid. And that's how you find yourself. And it's really kind of interesting that Jesus said that whoever loses himself in my service will find themselves. And it's interesting that it, that it works, it really works that way. You, I don't know if you remember The Sound of Music, but it's a great musical, classic musical. When Rolf is singing to the Von Trapp daughter, he's, he says these words. He said, love in the heart wasn't put there to stay. Love isn't love till it's given away. Yeah. yeah. And I really believe that, really think that those lyrics from Rodgers and Hammerstein are just spot on. That's how we find ourselves, by giving it away. Paul, when you were at rock bottom, whatever you would consider rock bottom for you, if you if you can, man, expound a little bit on what was that like and what was what were you going through emotionally, mentally, even physically? And I know that you mentioned that you're a believer. So I wanted you to talk a little bit about that and how your faith, how God came into your life and created that transformation and that transition for you. That's a great question, Michael. I think that when people, and, and including myself, when, when I was down and out, I found that if I sat around, nothing happened. Mm -hmm. Nothing, nothing <laughs> happened. What? You know, I, I thought love was supposed to come to me. It nah, doesn't doesn't work that way. So I found that movement, absolute movement in any circumstance, you got to get out. You got to get out. Go get some fresh air. Go move about. Go help someone. Go help somebody move. Go help somebody have a better day. By doing that, that's how you get out, get out of that, that rut. That's how you get out of that, those down days. You you sit around. It's not going to happen. It's not going to go away by itself. Just go out and do something. Something good. So, you know, many of our listeners that are listening is struggling with how to identify, how to fix some of these issues that they may have had or bottling up emotions and trauma. Can you share some life lessons, some tips, or some actionable steps that they could take away from uh, this conversation that we're having today? Absolutely, Michael. I think that um, as simple as it is, you know, it was very simple for the children of Israel to look at the staff that Moses was holding up. He said they'd be healed just by looking. They said, that's so easy. That's not going to do anything. And, and that's kind of where we're at. The simple thing of rolling a die and having that be what you're, how you're going to love all day that day, it works miracles. I was surprised myself. I didn't think, I didn't think it was going to work as good as it worked. But what it did for me, Michael, is it said, I, my previous attitude was, 
what's wrong with that person? What, why can't they do the right thing? And I would you just try to jump in and get in their life. Mm -hmm. You don't belong there. Stand, stay in your lane. And what I found is that instead of saying that in my mind, the paradigm shift for me was what's right with that person. What can I love about that person? And focusing on that, I kept so busy, so absolutely busy. I forgot to be angry. I forgot to be annoyed. I just thought I lost any desire to have any annoyances. Said this is a lot happier life. Why didn't I do this before? It's so easy. Absolutely, man. So as we get ready to wrap up and get out of here, man, if you can tell our audiences that's listening to you, how can they get a hold of you? How could they book you for a podcast? How could they book you for a speaking engagement? How could they work with you as well? They can get a hold of me through my website. It's probably the best best way. That's rolloflove.com, R-O-L-E of love.com. I live two hours north of Las Vegas. I did a play on the words, you roll the die, but the roll, R-O-L-E, changes you within. So you want that change within, it, You the die will help you. It really will help you. As simple as it is, you can remember pictures, and that's, that's how it will work for you. They can contact me through my website. They've got the, the die the book, the journal in a bundle right now, that's a whole lot less than even one therapy session. $29.99 is the, is the sale price right now. It's about 20% off, and I'll hold that price through the end of the year. Absolutely. Paul, before we get out of here, man, um, any last words you would like to leave with our audience? One last word, Michael, and, and it's, a, it's a language word. I'm going to take it from the Sanskrit dialect in northern India. From that Sanskrit dialect, we get the word nirvana, we get the word karma, but the word I want to talk about is namaste. Mm. Put, your, put your hands together, point your thumb toward your chest, and bow your head, close your eyes, say namaste. Doesn't mean, hey, y'all, class is over when you're in a yoga class. Doesn't mean that. The Hindu translation means the God in me sees the God in you. Or in other words, the divine in me sees the divine in you. And we need to watch for the good in people. Most people are intrinsically good. Most people are over that 50% line. They're good. Watch for the good parts. Why are we focusing on the minority spots in the people? Watch for those good things and make the world a better place. Start with you. Start with your family. Start with your community. Start with your state and nation. Let's make it a world, world thing. I'm going to say Paul, thank you so much for coming on Overcoming Adversity podcast to share your story, man. I know we started off and hearing the interesting story of your grandparents and your dad to hear the tradition of what took place for you, man, is truly, truly fascinating. But to hear the story and the journey of what you've been through to become the man that you are today now and sharing your story and not just helping so many people, man, I'm truly, truly blessed to hear your story, man. So thank you, man. Thank you, Michael. It's been a pleasure to be with you today. Absolutely, man. So guys, make sure if you like this podcast episode, you make sure you leave a comment. Make sure you share with the family and friend. Maybe Make sure that they understand the significance of showing love and spreading that joy towards their family, their friends, and just people across this world. We're in a very, very, very uh, serious time in these days with, if you're watching the news and you can see what's going on. So having Paul on to come on and share his story and the significance of it, I think, was truly, truly important. Make sure you like and subscribe. Until next time, guys, God bless. Can't complain at all. Couple dollars in my pocket, no income and go. Been working on my body, getting healthier. Thank God for clarity.